Let's continue with vision by looking at light. Now, what we think of as light or visible light is just a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's much more out there, and of course, we've invented some nice little machines and tools that let us look at some of those things. But of course, our eyes won't do that. There's some other terms you want to be familiar with with light. One of those is refraction, which is where you get a bending of it. Due to the shape of our cornea and lens, we get a refraction of all that light coming into our eye so that it all comes together and strikes at one small little point, which is what the focal point is. And from that point, those light rays cross over so that actually everything you see is upside down on your retina in the back of your eye, but somehow our brain always flips it upright. Convergence is where this light strikes going through a convex surface. Again, you look at something that's very dome-shaped. That's what they're talking about here. So we'll look at that focal point more when we talk about light coming into the eye. Focusing. We definitely have to focus on light and objects which are closer or farther away. And our natural focus is really set at 20 feet or further. So if we want to focus on near objects, we've got to change the thickness of the lens inside of our eye. And a lot of people have trouble with that. That's one of the big causes for reading glasses to be needed there. But looking at visible light, again, we mentioned this is a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is only 380 to 750 nanometers of all of that spectrum. So that's just one tiny little portion of it. But looking at our focusing between distant and near, there's a lot of differences with these and what's happening with structures inside of the eyes. So let's start with our distant vision. Now remember the ciliary muscles are found anterior. They're on the front, but deep inside the eye, but towards the front, top and bottom. And these ciliary muscles can change the thickness of our lens because they have little ligaments attached to that lens. Now that lens should be a very nice elastic structure. So again, with those muscles, what they can do is change the thickness of the lens, which is what moves the focal point in the eye, more to the front or more to the back. When you move it more to the back, the light rays cross over more to the back and an image is gonna look small. You move that focal point to the front, the light rays cross over more forward anterior, which by the time they get to the back of the eye, they've spread apart further and that's gonna make objects look nearer, which is what you think of when something's close to you. So when these ciliary muscles relax, there's a lot of tension on the lens. Again, it's nice and elastic, so that pulls on it and that flattens it out. This is gonna move the focal point more to the rear of the eye. The light rays cross over more to the back so they don't spread apart far by the time they hit the back of the eye where you got your rods and cones. That's the photoreceptive layer. So since they don't spread far apart, an object looks small. This is what you need to happen inside the eye when something's far away. If you think about it, when something's far away, it does look small. But look at what happens with your near vision. When objects are closer, the ciliary muscles contract. That moves them closer towards the front of your eye, and that lets the tension off the lens. That'll let that lens thicken up, and that moves that focal point, the crossing of the light rays more to the front of the eye. So this lets them cross over more by the time they get to the back of the eye, the objects look larger. So that's how it's all going to work when something's close. And of course, when something's near to you, it does look larger to you. Looking below here at some other words, emotropia, the normal resting condition of the lens right there. There's where those ciliary muscles are relaxed and the lens is pretty much flat at that point right there. But looking at the far point of our vision, this is the point at which the lens does not have to thicken to focus. And this is gonna be 20 feet or further. So our natural focus is really set on anything that's 20 feet or further away. When you wanna focus on close objects, that's often when people have some trouble. So look at this near point of vision. As we said, near point of vision is gonna be anything closer than 20 feet. You gotta have some changes happening inside of the eye. Number one, you're gonna have changes occurring with the lens. Number two, you're gonna have changes in the size of the pupil. And then lastly, the distance between the pupils. So go back to the first one, the changes in the lens, what's called accommodation. This is the process by which the eye works to maintain a clear image on something. As it moves closer to you or further away, this has to occur. This happens when the ciliary muscles contract. Of course, this is autonomic. This is gonna be under parasympathetic control through the third cranial nerve. And this is gonna pull the choroid layer towards the lens, reducing tension on those ligaments. 
that's going to make the lens more spherical, giving a greater refraction, a greater bending of the light. At the same time, we need pupil constriction. This will decrease the size of the pupil at this time when something's getting closer to you, and that increases the depth of our focus. We also need to look at convergence of the eyes and the pupils. As objects move closer, the eyes are rotated medially. Remember the medial rectus muscles right to the very inside closest to the nose will pull them closer together. If you move your finger closer and closer to you touch your nose, you can definitely see those muscles are contracting, drawing the eyes together. Looking at the structure and function of the retina, remember this is that photoreceptive layer where we got the rods and cones, where we have the photoreceptive neurons that actually give us our vision. So looking at the sensory part of the retina, there's three layers. There's the photoreceptive layer, there's a group of bipolar neurons, and a little ganglionic group of neuron cell bodies right deep to them. Then there's the pigmented retina. Here's where we have a single layer of cells filled with melanin. You've seen melanin discussion before back with things like with the skin in the integumentary system. But with this choroid, this will enhance our visual acuity by isolating individual photoreceptors. If you can reduce the scattering of light, that's going to help objects to look clearer and sharper to you. But let's back, look back at this photoreceptive layer. We got rods and cones. Let's start with the rods. This is a bipolar group of photoreceptive cells, and they give us black and white vision. Now, that's the disadvantage to them. So you don't get good color vision with these rods, just black and white. But the advantage is they'll work under very low light conditions. Think about if you're outside long after the sun has gone down and there's a small amount of light. You can still see where things are, but they're just shades of gray. You can't see any color in them. That's when the rods are working right there. Now, if you look at where they're at, most of them are they're found over most of the retina, but not so much in that fovea, which is that center part. So they're more to the outer regions. Now, again, these are more sensitive to light than what the cones are we'll look at next. But again, they just give the black and white vision. There's a protein in these rods called rhodopsin, and it will change shape whenever it's struck by light. This will eventually separate into two different components called opsin and retinol. Now this retinol can be converted to vitamin A. From this, it was where it originally came from. And in the absence of light, opsin and retinol recombine to form the rhodopsin once again. So it's always being converted back and forth. The rods are an unusual group of sensory cells. When they're not stimulated, they're actually hyperpolarized. Light will cause them to depolarize. Again, they'll generate electric signals. Again, they're very good for non-color vision, but they work well in low light. And again, they're found over most of the eye, but not in the center. The depolarization of these rods will cause a depolarization of the bipolar cells, which are deeper, and then lastly, the ganglionic cells after them. So light and dark adaptation, all about adjusting to the changes in the light. That happens because of changes in the amount of the rhodopsin that's going to be available. Looking at light and dark eye adaptation more, the rods again in bright light, they have more of this rhodopsin broken down into vitamin A, and that protects the eyes from something which would be too bright. That could obviously be damaging. In darker conditions, more of the rhodopsin is produced, so the eyes more sensitive to light. So in other words, there's not much light around you, you make more of this rhodopsin. It takes the little eyes a little while to accommodate and change to low light conditions. That's why if you walk into a very dark room, at first you can't see very well, but given a little bit of time, you will. And again, with those pupils, they're going to constrict in bright light. Remember, the pupils are the little holes right in the very front of your eye. So if you get outside where there's a lot of light, you want them to constrict. That way, less light's coming in in those bright conditions. But you get in a very dark area, that pupil's going to dilate. It's going to open up. That way, you can get more light in. Looking at the cones right here, a group of bipolar neuron cells here. Now again, these give us our sharp color vision, but they won't work under low light conditions. Got to have plenty of light entering the eye. Now these here are very numerous in the fovea, in the macula lutea, which is at the center of the uh, eye, center of the retina. You don't see as many of them scattered to the outsides like you do with the rods. So as light sense intensity decreases, these aren't going to work. You're not going to see sharp color vision. With this visual pigment idopsin, there's three different types of lights which the brain interprets. And technically, there's no such thing as color in these different wavelengths here. 
but somehow our brain interprets a different wavelength of light as a color. So with this iodopsin, we actually only see blue, red, and green, but you can mix those colors together and just get millions of different combinations. So again, the cones are good for color vision, but they won't work when there's not plenty of light around you. And again, most of them are found towards the center of the eye. And if you look at another way, our vision is affected by having two eyes as opposed to one. By having two eyes, what's called a binocular vision, this allows two different visual fields to overlap at the same time. And this gives us depth perception. It also prevents us from having any blind spots back where all those axons are coming in and out at the rear of our eye. Looking at a few eye disorders here, one of them is myopia what's more commonly called nearsightedness. If you're nearsighted, you can see near, but not far. This occurs when the focal point is too near the lens. The image is focused in front of the retina at this point. With hyperopia, farsightedness, here's where you can see far, but not near. The image is trying to focus behind the retina instead of on it here. Presbyopia is where you're losing flexibility in the lens. This is gonna happen as you get older. So cause degeneration of the accommodation, and this is often corrected by reading glasses. You can tell when somebody's getting presbyopia when they hold that book further and further away from their face. That's loss of flexibility in that lens that's causing that. There's astigmatism. Here's where the cornea of the lens is not curved uniformly. It's not a nice perfect dome. You got some flat regions to it. <clears throat> Sometimes that can be corrected with surgeries and lasers. Sometimes glasses will do it. Strabismus, a lack of parallelism of the light pass going through the eyes. You're not going to have good vision at that time. Retinal detachment, somebody maybe uh, has a head-on collision in a car, the retina can actually detach from the back of the eye. And that could result in partial loss of vision or blindness. Glaucomas, where you get an increase in intraocular pressure. In other words, you've got a fluid buildup in the eye. Remember towards the front of the eye, top and bottom, you got these holes called the canals of Schlem. That's how that fluid gets out. They get clogged up with proteins and such. The fluid builds. It changes the shape of the eye and disturbs the vision. Cataracts is where you get a clouding of the lens due to a buildup of those proteins. You may have seen this where somebody's eyes look milky. Macular degeneration is just due to a loss of vision due to the natural effects of aging. You get older, that's probably going to happen. With diabetes, you get a loss in circulation everywhere in the body. And since you look at that retinal layer, there's a lot of blood vessels going to those rods and cones. You lose that blood flow, you can lose that vision. You can lose the activity of those rods and cones and go blind if that gets worse and worse. And diabetic retinopathy is one of the leading causes of blindness in the United States.